Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx and to who is now joining us on Facebook Live. The Geneva Environment Network has the pleasure to welcome you today virtually for the fifth edition of the Big Plastic Pollution Dialogues, organized in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, and the governments of Norway and of Switzerland. For those who wouldn't yet know our platform, we are a network of more than 100 institutions and secretariats based in Geneva that make this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. Administrated by the United Nations Environment Programme and supported by Switzerland, we organize various networking activities, including regular multi-stakeholder roundtables and briefings on major environmental trends. The Geneva Beat Plastic Dialogues aim at uh, linking uh, different um, plastic issues to the governance question and encourage increased engagement in the run-up to various global environmental negotiations that will take place this year and next year. And again, we, he we heard yesterday that uh, some negotiations uh, rescheduled to take place this year will finally only take place uh, next year. We want to understand how we are using specific global instruments to address the plastics crisis and how we could use them better. The first session focused on plastics and waste, the second on plastics, climate and air pollution, the third on issues related to human rights, and the fourth session last week on plastics and health. The swesh, the sesh, these sessions recommended to adopt a life cycle approach to the plastic crisis and work on comprehensive responses that um, integrate environmental human rights and health concerns reinforce, adapt, and coordinate existing instruments to address plastics and chemical additives. They also recommended to support a global legally binding agreement that addresses the entire plastics uh, life cycle. Among the recommendations was also foster circularity by developing regional and national processes, including extended producer responsibility, reduce the production of plastics and stop the development of new petrochemical infrastructure, support scientific research on plastics and its impacts in relation to various fields, disseminate information and communicate effectively in the impacts of plastics. And there were also various recommendations on started, but we were waiting for this session we are hosting today and uh, for which you have joined us to communicate uh, on this. Before I give the floor to today's moderator who will guide you through this session, let me briefly introduce uh, you to our panel. We have with us uh, from Switzerland, Reinhard Weisinger, uh, who is a former senior expert. Uh, and until recently, uh, he was working for the ESO Central Secretariat. In Australia, we have with us Karen Harbonheimer, who is a lecturer at the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security, Anchors, in the University of Wollongong. And Karen was uh, the main cohort author of the Nordic Plastic Report issued at the end of last year. We have also with us uh, Justin Walks, who is the executive director of ECOS, a worldwide environmental organization specialized in standardization. From Paris with us, uh, Feng Wang, who is um, a coordinator on security and waste within the United Nations Environment Program Consumption and Production Unit. In Geneva, again, Anja van der Rapp, uh, who is a senior program coordinator for climate change and food security at the World Intellectual Property Organization. And finally, with us uh, also from Geneva, Caroline Dier Birbeck, who is a senior researcher at the Global Governance Center of the Gratier uh, Institute in Geneva, and um, who is one of the co organizers of the Big Plastic Pollution Dialogues. And she will be guiding you through uh, the session. Let me also remind you that the video of this event and the presentations made, as well as a summary, will be available online on the web page of this event. You can raise your questions in the Q&A box um, available on WebEx for who is with us uh, on the social network, just leave a comment and we will uh, also uh, take that into consideration. We will address these questions at the end of these sessions during the Q&A uh, uh, part of this event. Caroline, over to you. Great. Anna and for the introduction. So today's session on plastics and standards, as Diana mentioned, is the fifth dialogue to be organized as part of this series and part of a process of making recommendations towards a high level dialogue on plastic governance, which will be held uh, later in February. 
at the Global Governance Centre. We're really delighted to be a co-host of this series, along with the um, Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat with the Centre for International Environmental Law, um, Norway and Switzerland. Um, so today we're going to focus on the growing interest among governments and stakeholders in how standards can support efforts to reduce plastic pollution. So already there are a vast array of standards that play a role in shaping the plastics economy. Here we want to look at what kind of role these standards can play in helping us reduce plastic um, pollution. So at the national and the regional uh, level, um, there's growing interest um, in regulation and in policy papers and discussions on the need for stronger and clearer environmental standards for plastics. Um, in, the, in the EU context, um, for instance, talk about this, a more circular plastics economy uh, often uh, includes discussion of the role of improved standards um, as, as one way of, of helping promote a more circular plastics economy. And at the international level, a number of multilateral environmental agreements already contain um, various types of standards that are relevant to plastics. And there are several proposals um, in the context um, of calls for a new UN Global Plastic Pollution Treaty that also emphasise the need for more international cooperation on standards. Now, as you will um, learn in this discussion, the word standards is used um, in different ways by different people in this in this discussion. And, you know, sometimes people are actually referring to regulations or to voluntary standards. Um, so there's there's quite a lot of um, to do in terms of unpacking that language. But in this section, we're lucky to have some leading experts that can guide us through the relevance of standards to efforts to reduce plastic pollution. So the key topics that we're going to cover is sort of to get a sense of the state of play on existing standards relevant to reducing plastic pollution, what kind of problems and gaps exist, and what are the efforts underway to, to address some of those gaps. We're going to look at the current um, status of governance of the institutions and processes relevant to standard setting for, for plastics and plastics pollution, and the kinds of actors that are engaged. We're also going to focus in on what governments and stakeholders can do to cooperate better in this space um, to overcome challenges that there may be in respect of governance and to also to make sure that we um, do we use uh, use standards in a way that helps us address the plastic pollution um, problem efficiently. We're also going to look at importantly some of the limitations around standards in terms of implementation the challenges in terms of participation in standard setting processes, um, and also the, the challenges that businesses may face in meeting a proliferating array of standards, especially businesses in developing countries. So as Dan, um, as Dan has already introduced all of the speakers, um, I would note that we have both some actors from within and beyond International um, Geneva, and we're really hoping that we can leave this discussion with a much greater understanding of uh, how um, standards are relevant to this dis international discussion on on boosting cooperation around plastic pollution. So we've divided the discussion into two sections. We'll start first with two that are more scene setting presentations, and then we'll move into some of the challenges, opportunities, and emerging issues. So with that, I'll welcome our first speaker. Reinhard, you have the floor. Okay, uh, Caroline, thank you very much. And um, I have prepared a presentation. Could uh, somebody from the organizers please? Okay, so uh, this is a presentation that introduces the standardization landscape and gives also a little bit of overview of uh, the actors that are active in uh, the development of standards on plastics. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I will start with a basic definition of what standards is, because I think uh, this is an important, uh, there are some important components to, to understand here, that uh, standards, number one, are typically voluntary instruments. So they are not regulations, uh, but they are voluntary instruments and they're developed by experts uh, from various, uh, let's say, uh, stakeholders that come together and they develop through consensus um, the, um, uh, a standard. Standards are based on uh, science technology experience and standards can, uh, uh, if uh, under certain conditions, also become part of regulation. Next slide, please. This is based on, by the way, the ISO IC guide and the WTO agreement, uh, which differ a little bit uh, with regard to their definition of standards. So standards are not regulations. This is very important to keep in mind, but they are voluntary instruments, whereas regulations are mandatory and uh, um, a compulsory instrument. So next slide, please. 
But as just uh, said, standards can also become part of regulation or support regulation by either regulation uh, incorporating standards, referencing standards, uh, or that in private uh, agreements, uh, in, in contracts, you uh, uh, agree between, uh, let's say, in a, be, between business partners on the use of certain standards. In this case, standards can be mandatory, can uh, obtain a mandatory status, but typically standards are voluntary. And this is what we want to stick to in this presentation. Please go uh, next slide. You see here an overview of what I call, um, or what is often called the formal standardization system, a kind of pyramid where you have on the very basis company and industry standards, where they develop standards on their own, or they adopt standards from the higher level. But then the formal system com uh, con uh, is comprised of national standards and national standards organizations, um, uh, then regional standards and regional standards organizations, and on top you have international standards and international standards organizations. Now, the international standards are often, and as well as the regional standards, adopted at other levels. So the international standards uh, are often adopted as national standards. Uh, the regional standards are adopted as national standards. And uh, the other way around, national standards can be an input uh, into the development of regional or international standards. So that's basically a very uh, the traditional uh, view of a formal standardization system. Next slide, please. You see here a much more probably confusing slide, and the confusion is not completely unintentional. Uh, you see uh, the, the um, you see uh, national standards bodies, then there are international standards bodies. Some of these international standards bodies belong to the UN system. You have regional standards in Europe, where you have a large and very intensive development of standards, and then also standards uh, organization in other parts of the world. In the United States, you have many organizations that develop standards for certain subject areas. And then in this block, uh, the, the red uh, block is something which is outside, I would, which, which I would call this outside the formal system. And this is increasing since, let's say, the 1980s, 1990s, where you have more and more organizations uh, that uh, have uh, memberships from all around the world uh, in the area of IT and telecommunication technology on the one side, what is called here the global consortia, and then you have also kind of global organizations that are mainly NGO driven in the area of sustainability. And the, the key term here is the voluntary sustainability standards, of which there are most likely something like 400, maybe more around the world. You see here the FSC, uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, and the uh, Social Accountability International just mentioned as some examples. So these organizations play an increasing role. They merge to a certain extent with a formal standardization system. There is some synergy, but there's definitely also competition. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the general, let's say, um, uh, pathway of impact of standards, I think you can uh, see this in the following way. So standards as an instrument to generate impacts, which is societal impacts, economic impacts, environmental impacts, uh, technology dissemination, and so on. It starts out with some kind of, let's say, knowledge generation, innovation, uh, new opportunities that are introduced into the standardization process, into a standardization organization, maybe one organization, there may be more than one organization, and you have a process that is based on this consensus building activity uh, where uh, stakeholders from different uh, uh, um, uh, groups, uh, academia, uh, let's say societal groups, uh, governmental agencies, business, uh, and so on, uh, they come together and they develop uh, a standard and that uh, uh, once done uh, uh, is is then published by the standards organization and uh, this knowledge is so to say made available to society channeled through societal channels economic uh, in, uh, in in the economy and leads to standards implementation and the implementation of standards then results in impacts 
Uh, and some of these standards require verification of compliance through uh, what is called conformity assessment that you can be sure that a certain product, a certain process, a certain organization meets uh, really the, um, the requirements as stated in a standard and is claimed by this organization or by the manufacturer of a product. Okay, now move move on we now moving uh, next slide please we now move i want to give a little bit of an overview of plastics and standards in plastics and i concentrate on uh, three main organization which is the iso the international organization for standardization send the european committee for standardization and uh, astm international formerly uh, american society for testing and materials but as you can see with an obviously an international acclaim to international relevance and a de facto international relevance beyond these organizations are other organizations also in the let's say the ngo uh, field or maybe more driven by academia that develop standards like uh, instruments uh, that are are available on the market and they may also be introduced as inputs into the standardization process and may become formal standards at a later point in time. Next slide, please. So the first uh, uh, is, uh, the, here's an ISO committee on plastics. Uh, this committee was uh, created already in 1947, so it has a long history. ISO itself was created, was established in 1947. And uh, this committee has uh, over, close to 700 standards, is very active, has 130 projects ongoing. This is the structure of the committee. And you see here there's an SC14, a subcommittee 14, that deals with environmental aspects. The rest, the other uh, um, uh, sort of vast majority of the standards developed by this committee uh, are uh, in the area of, uh, let's say, testing of uh, the durability uh, of plastics, uh, the behavior of plastic uh, under uh, different environmental conditions and so on, and the uh, use of, of plastics for certain uh, types of products. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, now an overview of this uh, SC4 subcommittee 14 environmental aspect of plastics. As you can see from the titles, it deals with biodegradability. Uh, it deals with also sampling methods for testing uh, behavior of plastics under certain and uh, degradability of plastics under certain conditions like marine conditions, uh, determination of the disintegration of uh, plastics over time, and uh, also uh, it uh, develops standards on environmental footprints of bio-based plastics as well as compostable plastics. So this is what I wanted to say, just to give a short overview of what this committee does. Uh, there is another uh, committee in ISO, which I have not uh, included here. It deals with environment and packaging, uh, also um, uh, uh, re relevant standards, but I wanted to stick to pre purely the uh, plastic standards committees. The next slide, please. Here is another uh, committee that works very closely together with the ISO committee uh, on uh, uh, of the European Standards Organization, SEN. Uh, you see uh, here it has a number, it has no subcommittees, it has a number of working groups, and it deals with recycling of plastics, also environmental aspects of plastics, and bio-based and biodegradable uh, de uh, de degradable plastics. So the, uh, basically it uh, uh, operates on developing methods, test methods, determination uh, for the determination of the biodegradable or the degradability of plastics in various environments, whether it's bio-based plastics or not, as well as biodegradability, carbon and environmental footprint. It deals with microplastics and it deals also with the recycling and the waste management uh, in relation to plastics. So it has, this committee has over 500 standards and uh, over 50 projects. So this is also quite a lot of work uh, going on in this committee. Next slide, please. Then we have another committee uh, in the, within the same, the European Standards Organizations, Organization SEN on bio-based products. Uh, this uh, is a smaller committee, uh, also, also a newer committee, was established, I think, in 2000. 
I'm not not absolutely sure, but maybe 2010, 2009 or so. And uh, it uh, develops um, uh, standards for bio-based products covering horizontal aspects. So that means not specific to any product type, but let's say sustainability criteria, life cycle analysis and related issues that apply to all types of bio-based products, as well as certification and uh, uses life cycle assessment methods. Next slide, please. Uh, here uh, to the uh, ASTM International, so a US-based uh, um, organization that uh, has a committee also on plastics, D20. This committee was already, interestingly, established in 1937, so 10 years earlier than the ISO committee. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, ASTM is an organization well established uh, with a long history and uh, attracting many experts and developing high quality standards. You see uh, the majority of the standards of this committee are also in the traditional plastics field, so behavior of plastic, durability of plastic, behavior under, let's say, heat and uh, uh, um, other kinds of conditions, uh, mechanical properties, and so on. And there are two committees, uh, younger committees, on recycled plastics and environmentally degradable plastics and bio-based plastics uh, that uh, address uh, uh, test methods for bio-based uh, to determine bio-based content, recycling, degradability of uh, plastics under various conditions and uh, issues of biodegradability. Next slide, please. So uh, what I believe we need uh, in, uh, generally to do in standardization, and probably this is increasing, it's an approach which is uh, um, uh, taking more and more prominence, but I think not yet enough to have a holistic view of uh, the plastic value chain uh, with the different, let's say, stages, raw material, uh, generation, production, use and sorting, and the end of life, all seen from a perspective of design. Sign. So that means if we talk about usability of plastic, we need to consider other aspects like the end of life, like the sortability, like the recyclability. And I believe that by looking in the past more on the, let's say, functional uh, aspects of plastics, that was not given uh, uh, sufficient attention. So from this perspective, uh, obviously, then the issue of leakage that can occur all through the uh, value chain, we have to address uh, that from a design perspective upstream and not can uh, should not leave it to to to, uh, to uh, later stages in the in the plastics. Let's say value chain. Now, next slide. So some recommendations for standardization and, and standards. So this is not complete. Uh, uh, I cannot claim that this is a common consensus based, so to say, uh, uh, agreement. But uh, as uh, shown in the slide before, what ne is needed for standardization uh, in general, but also standardization of plastic and plastic products is a systemic a whole value chain ap approach to consider issues of reuse, not just single use and single single functionality as well as end of life aspects in order to extend the life of plastics, the usability and reusability in order to, by doing this, saving uh, plastics and uh, keeping it out of the environment. Uh, then I believe also we have seen there are quite a quite a lot of committees and uh, activities in standardization, and this is not the whole picture, but I think uh, I've picked out the key organizations working in this field. Uh, it is not so easy to keep an overview of what actually this organization does, what does that organization do. Uh, do. And uh, so therefore, what I would uh, uh, claim is uh, would be very relevant is a kind of uh, mapping with regard to the equivalence or the, let's say, essential equivalence between standards. So that means if you are in the US and you may use a US standard, let's say an ASTM standard, uh, and you know that this standard is more or less equivalent to some of the European standards, that this can also be recognized and you understand this and partners, business partners in Europe understand it. And uh, this could be facilitated through, uh, let's say, a higher level of uh, make disclosing equivalence. 
then I believe also taxonomies of standards and of their quality levels uh, are needed and need to be further developed and made um, known uh, because let's say if you have secondary raw materials and recycled plastics what's the level of quality what can you do with it and i believe that there needs to be further standards and testing methods and maybe also certification method to assure that uh, people can rely on certain uh, uh, assumed quality uh, further on, um, material passports for plastics and their embedded substances, so uh, uh, kind of material transparency. So what actually is in a plastic plastic product in order to be able to to know uh, what, how can it can it be uh, recycled, can it be reprocessed and so on. So transparency of uh, substance uh, uh, areas and, and then further on reduction of uh, use of different types of plastics. Is it possible that we actually, from a functional point of view, if we have a, a certain functionality of plastics, that we just standardize or just use a certain type of plastic instead of various forms and combinations and mixtures, uh, which make uh, the pro processing of uh, plastics through the value chain and recycling and reuse much more difficult. Labeling systems, I, I believe, is a very important, a simple and clear and understandable labeling systems, as well as what we have mentioned before already, the leakage, uh, systematically addressing leakage of plastics uh, uh, to the environment uh, uh, throughout the value chain. Uh, final slide. Um, thank you. Now, what about the upscaling of impact of standards? As we said in the very beginning, standards are voluntary instruments. So uh, the use of standards is mainly voluntary. Now, standards can be imposed by business partners, for example. They can be a market requirement. You are out of the market if you don't use certain standards. That's that's a possibility, but typically they're they are voluntary. So a company decides we use these standards or we may have a, an advantage and so on. And I believe that this is uh, a, a clear impediment. For that reason, I would uh, think what we really need to do in order to using standards to uh, uh, to to generate impact and scale up impacts to uh, 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 to address plastics pollution, that we need clear and measurable policy objectives regulatory measures incentive systems or so tax incentives and so on basic governmental in, uh, involvement by setting up intelligent systems that stimulate the uptake of standards, financial support for these initiatives, as well as then uh, further support in disseminating uh, the knowledge about the standards, the content of the standards through educational training and educational programs. So in one final sentence, standards, in my view, are an important um, component of a solution to address uh, um, plastics pollution, but on their own, they are not sufficient. Standards need support from through policies, financing, regulation, and combined, they can be very powerful. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Reinhard. That was just an amazing um, overview. I think for everyone, you've really set out some of the challenges, the state of play, the kinds of things that need to be considered in understanding the role of plastics in uh, of standards in a wider uh, policy making framework. So I'm going to shift now swiftly um, to Karen Raubenheimer, who I must cheer for because she's up past midnight in Australia to join this uh, <laughs> panel, and we look forward to um, to your um, introduction to how you see the issues of standards fitting into wider efforts to boost international cooperation on standard uh, on plastic pollution. Karen, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. I think I have a slideshow. There we go. So good day to everyone or good night if you're also in Australia. And a big thank you to Diana, Carolyn and the team for organising this very important discussion. Um, and I truly do believe it is one of the most important threads in working out how to solve the global problem of plastic pollution. Standards are a key component of a possible new agreement um, at the international level that we've outlined in the Nordic report. Uh, next slide, please. So although many will say standards are not the only tool, I do believe they are core to reducing the residual waste across the life cycle of plastics thereby reducing the possibility of leakage into the environment, but also reducing greenhouse gas emissions and other impacts. 
And if used properly at the national level, they can also help improve livelihoods for many vulnerable communities. So instead of expecting local governments to continually throw more money at managing our ever increasing generation of plastic waste, and instead of expecting those in the sorting and recycling industries to keep reverse engineering the constant influx of new products with more complex designs, we should be tackling the problem from the design phase and standards can help us with this approach. So this is what we set out to achieve in this framework agreement. And I think this dialogue we're having here today should reinforce the need for an international legally binding agreement to really make standards functional across the global value chain. You'll hear today from the panelists about the technicalities of developing standards, but I'll hopefully shed some light on the political process of making those standards operational across the global value chain. Uh, next slide, please. So as we know, standards are closely linked to labeling as well as trade. The proposed design of the agreement uses global standards as a central tool for countries to manage and regulate the products placed on their markets both from domestic and international sources. And this can be based on their current infrastructure and ability to deal with the product at the end of life. Where a product doesn't meet the standards, a country can ban it or place higher taxes on it to help pay for the management of the product or insist on some form of EPR or take back scheme. So although it's not a trade agreement that we proposed, it does aim to influence the products traded internationally which is particularly important for those countries who don't have domestic manufacturers and only import plastics. But it also aims to manage those markets where products are manufactured and consumed in the same country. So it should ultimately provide a mechanism to influence the international markets as well as the domestic markets. So how does this proposed framework agreement aim to do this? I'll first explain the hierarchy of the standards and then what we meant by the terms in the report. For the hierarchy, the proposed design has three, uh, can we go back to the previous uh, slide, please? Yeah, there we go. For the hierarchy, the proposed design has three key operational implementation measures that countries who sign up to the agreement would agree to undertake. The first has an international focus and the second and third have a national focus. So firstly, countries would be agreeing to participate in the process of designing the global standards which in the report we are calling international sustainability criteria. Secondly, parties to the agreement would incorporate these international sustainability criteria into national plastic sustainability standards. These may be new or existing standards. And then thirdly, as with most multilateral agreements, countries must develop national action plans, which we have called national plastics management plans. These action plans will map out how country plans to manage the main drivers of plastic pollution within their domestic context and across the full life cycle of plastics within their domestic markets, thus going beyond marine litter action plans and waste management action plans. These national plastics management plans would also incorporate the national plastic sustainability standards developed as per the new agreement. Countries will be given flexibility in a bottom up approach but all action plans must work towards achieving the global objective and the four strategic goals. One advantage of having an international legally binding agreement is that a financial mechanism can be attached to the agreement to provide assistance to those countries who historically haven't had the capacity to participate in processes of developing global standards. Assistance can also be provided for the development of national plastic sustainability standards and the development of national plastics management plans. Uh, next slide again, thanks. So what do we mean by the terms international sustainability criteria and national plastic sustainability standards? The hierarchy proposed in the report is that at the global level, the framework agreement would outline broad sustainability criteria. These could be seen as performance criteria that direct the outputs to be achieved and could promote reuse, durability, repairability, recyclability, and prevention of leakage. They would be formulated by the parties to the agreement, possibly through open-ended technical working groups. They could also be formulated subsequent to the adoption of the agreement and at various levels of detail or compulsion. For example, they could be binding high-level targets or voluntary international standards or even high-level aspirational targets. By including this language in the agreement, we could establish the legal basis to develop the next level 
which could be annexes, guidelines, protocols, and other implementing instruments under the framework agreement. These could address in more detail particular applications or materials and could include work already done under other fora such as the ISO. We could then also develop technical standards, uh, testing protocols and certification schemes. So as we move down the hierarchy of standards and the level of detail increases, the inclusion of industry and technical experts would be expected to increase too. The final level is the National Plastic Sustainability Standards. These are operationalized through the regulation of domestic markets, but in accordance with the international sustainability criteria and the development of market-based instruments. These national market-based instruments would aim to promote behavior change by both industry and consumers and provide funding mechanisms for waste management services. And as mentioned, these activities may be elaborated in the national plastics management plans. So it's important to note that this framework agreement is not a trade agreement and it's not a waste management agreement, but it does aim to improve trade through narrowing it down to better design products and importantly leading to improved waste management globally. It does this by providing the tools, namely the global design standards, to assist countries to move their waste management services towards an autonomous self-funding system and it does that by providing the incentives to collect, reuse and recycle better designed plastic products, thereby improving the economic viability of such activities through improved product design. So we've seen growing support for standards as a key component in, sol in solving the plastic pollution issue. It has been mentioned in numerous UNIA resolutions on marine litter and microplastics, some of the reports and the proposed designs of a global framework submitted to UNIA and to the AHIG process I've also explicitly referenced the need for global standards. When I presented the approach to industry representatives and governments, they could clearly appreciate how such standards stimulate improvements to waste management services. Other processes such as the Stockholm Convention and SACOM, which are closely linked to the design of plastics, are looking at options for EPR schemes for chemicals. Most EPR schemes, however, only focus on the financial and the physical aspects of waste management. But there are two other important components of EPR where standards can help. This is the requirement to better design products and the requirement to reduce the waste generated across the life cycle. Standards can also help global and regional efforts to move to a circular economy and sustainable consumption and production patterns. Global standards could also fall within the upstream goal under the Basel Convention's partnership on plastic waste to prevent the generation of plastic waste as well as improving collection and recycling and the financing thereof. Last slide, thanks. So as brief as this presentation has been, I hope it's provided some thought on what the objectives of a new legally binding global agreement could be, and a first look in greater detail at a mechanism to use global standards to achieve a reduction in plastic pollution across the life cycle and the global value chain. And I encourage anyone who hasn't yet read the report and other material on the website to do so at uh, nordicreport2020.com and we welcome any thoughts and feedback on the report. Thanks, Karen. Great, thank you um, very much, Karen, for covering a huge uh, territory in very short time. Really useful to see the vision that you have set out for how um, standards issues might be dealt with in a, a new treaty. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor to Justin, but just before we move on, one of the things I wanted to address is that my understanding is we have, um, in thinking about reducing plastic pollution, we have de several different levers that that um, stakeholders and governments are focused on. One is better designed plastics and reducing um, plastic waste, but one is also uh, reducing our use of plastics altogether. So the question there is whether um, there's also a discussion around reducing the amount of plastic used in products or standards and labeling around um, packaging where, where, where we use less plastic packaging um, uh, with products. And I'm also aware that in the recent work uh, that the um, that was published breaking called Breaking the Plastic Wave, they really emphasize this, this need to think about um, also how we uh, develop standards for, for reuse and refill uh, kinds of um, systems as an as as one way of also uh, reducing the amount of plastic packaging, at least that is used. So I'm not sure if that's something that Justin is going to cover, but it will be useful um, to think about those as part of this wider uh, standards um, spe spectrum of, um, of, of necessary standards as well. Um, Justin, I give the floor to you and with his presentation, we're going to 
look a little bit, start looking a little bit more closely at some of the challenges, opportunities and emerging issues. So Justin, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, I, th I think perhaps I should start by introducing ECOS uh, before diving into standardization uh, and plastics. Uh, we're an international environmental uh, NGO. Uh, we are the only international environmental NGO that is active uh, across the board in the standardization system. Uh, and we work at international, uh, regional, including European uh, and the national level. And we work uh, across the board uh, on a host of environmental issues from environmental assessment and management, climate change mitigation and adaptation, sustainable products and materials uh, and waste. Uh, and at the international level, just to give you an idea of the scope uh, in which we are active, we, uh, we, we're active in around 30 ISO committees and 16 IEC committees. Uh, and in order to effectively participate uh, in the standardization world, uh, we use a combination of technical skills and expertise, uh, be that our 12 program staff or our 50 subcontracted experts, uh, which come from academia, consultancy, uh, or retired industry professionals uh, and from NGOs. Looking at plastics specifically, uh, we've deployed uh, four program staff uh, and around 10 experts, so around 20% of our expertise is directed towards plastics uh, at the moment. Uh, we're active in three ISO technical committees and eight of those, uh, eight of their working groups. Uh, we're active at the European level in six uh, SEN TCs uh, and 10 working groups within those uh, TCs. Uh, and we're also uh, engaging with the uh, UK's BSI uh, on plastic pellets. Uh, in terms of draft standards, we're focusing our finite resources on around 12 draft standards uh, in preparation. Now, let me turn uh, my attention to um, standards, what standards we currently have uh, and what standards uh, are missing uh, in the standardization portfolio. Uh, but let me just start by uh, stating uh, why plastic uh, pollution, I think, is uh, of relevance to the standardization system. Uh, plastic pollution uh, is not an accident. Uh, plastic pollution uh, is, in our, is in our environment by design, uh, and it's because of bad design. Uh, standards are developed uh, for the market, by the market, for the market, uh, and that includes markets that are badly designed. Generally, standards are developed uh, by, driven by industry, uh, and to a lesser extent, a much lesser extent, by policymakers. Uh, uh, in terms of which standards currently exist this are uh, relevant to uh, plastics and plastic pollution, uh, I'll look uh, specifically uh, at the European level. Uh, SEN and SENELEC uh, have uh, an interesting set of standards, horizontal standards on material efficiency uh, that cover plastics. Uh, there's a general method for assessing the proportion of recycled material content uh, in energy related products. Uh, and this is the general method for assessing the recyclability and recoverability of energy related products. Uh, so those the, and, and plastics are covered by uh, those standards. In terms of what's being developed, uh, I think there are two uh, sets of very interesting standards that are being developed. Uh, I'll come back to those two later, but those are standards in support of the EU single plastics directive, single use plastics directive. Uh, there's also an assessment method for recycled plastic content uh, under development uh, and a measurement method for the unintentional release of microplastics uh, and microfibers. Uh, on pellets, uh, we're active at the national level uh, with the UK's BSI uh, to develop a management standard uh, on plastic pellets, flakes and powders. Uh, and I think that's going to be, yeah, that's an interesting standard, uh, but it won't be going far enough. Uh, but I think it is an interesting first step uh, at the national level. We're also uh, working on a horizontal standard uh, on microplastics, uh, which is in the IEC uh, that Reinhardt uh, mentioned, and from a waste perspective uh, at the European level uh, on environmental aspects of plastics and the vocabulary. In terms of what's missing, uh, and I've only been given seven, seven to ten minutes, so obviously this is a, a summary. Uh, I think critically, uh, and this has been mentioned uh, by both previous speakers, um, the solution to the plastic pollution uh, lies in creating systems uh, that do not generate waste in the first place. Uh, unfortunately, industry standardizers uh, and policymakers still put their focus on waste collection and recycling. Systemic change uh, is needed uh, so that reusable, refillable solutions uh, become the new normal. 
So no standard currently exists uh, in the if you like in the mainstream standardization world for reusable packaging uh, across companies on a large scale. Uh, packaging remains uh, largely single use. Uh, common reusable packaging formats would offer great efficiency gains uh, such that any company can take back and reuse the same containers uh, for their products. I think another large gap uh, and a main source of uh, microplastic pollution uh, comes from tyres, vehicle tyres. Uh, so we do need a standard uh, for a harmonised test method uh, for the measurement of tyre abrasion uh, so that we can then move on to making sure that tyre abrasion can be included uh, in any labelling scheme uh, that does take place uh, so that consumers uh, can uh, ensure that they are buying uh, more environmentally friendly tyres. Uh, and I think uh, another key area for development uh, is on microplastics definitions. There is a need to harmonize uh, those definitions. ISO and CEN are not aligned here at the moment in their current discussions. And I think given that ISO and CEN have the same membership base uh, from Europe, surely that is a, that is a challenge that is uh, avoidable, avoidable. In terms of contentious issues, uh, I think the most challenging element is the lack of an ambitious regulatory framework, uh, whether that's national, regional uh, or international. Uh, and I think that means people do look to the standards developments organisations uh, for solutions uh, that these organisations are not incentivised to provide or in a position to provide. Uh, so I think that is a, is a, is a, key, a, a key gap there. Uh, I think in terms of participation, uh, we do have a, a fundamental issue here uh, in that effective participation and access to information in the standardization process is very, very difficult uh, for the environmental community. Uh, there is uh, that and that, that I think is not just the environmental community. I think if I look at developing countries as well, uh, there is also uh, an inclusiveness issue there for stakeholders uh, from developing countries. Uh, ECOS would be particularly interested uh, to work with environmental stakeholders from developing countries to facilitate their effective participation in the development uh, of international standards. Uh, and I think it's absolutely vital that standardization organizations uh, are inclusive uh, and without an inclusive uh, approach, without an open approach, without a transparent approach, uh, international standards do have a, a lower value uh, and a lower usefulness. And I think my final uh, area um, to look at uh, is uh, that standardization uh, is not a goal uh, in itself. Um, standards uh, and the means of implementing it uh, are key. Uh, standards, as, the, as Reinhardt mentioned, uh, they're voluntary uh, and they can be seen as a valuable tool to support legislation and international conventions uh, and agreements. Uh, and every effort should be made to ensure that standards uh, are not used to prevent uh, or circumvent legislation. Uh, and I think that is a, is a critical issue uh, that does need to be kept an eye on. Uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that I would return to the single use plastics directive, uh, which is a, a key piece of uh, European Union legislation. The European Commission uh, has requested them to develop two standards, uh, one on tethering caps and lids to beverage containers uh, and the other on circular fishing gear. Uh, both of those standards uh, are under development uh, and would not have been under development uh, by SEN, by the standardization body at European level, uh, without a request from the European Commission. Uh, those standards uh, won't be ready for a few more years, uh, even though obviously the market uh, is desperate for those standards already. Uh, and I think from a, from, a, from a business perspective, uh, business um, should avoid costs. Uh, and if you like, if you look at costs coming on business by various approaches uh, to plastic pollution, uh, business can avoid costs by innovating. Uh, costs will always be paid by society uh, and they will be lower when those are internalized. Uh, and I think the direction of travel on plastics pollution is clear. Sustainability is the order of the day uh, with the internalization of externalities. Uh, and I think uh, the winner uh, in that game from a, a business perspective uh, will be the first mover. Uh, they have the advantage. Uh, and why is that important? Because uh, I think if you look at this, 80% of environmental impacts uh, of a product uh, are being designed in at the design phase. Uh, it's clear that the winners of the future will be those that are designing out environmental impacts. Uh, and I think governments have a key role to play here. Uh, theory being sent, uh, very, very simple, disincentivize bad environmental design uh, and incentivize 
good environmental design. And I think international coordination and cooperation rather than competition uh, is key. I think it was very interesting to see a couple of weeks back uh, the Eurasia Group, uh, a risk consultancy, uh, having one of their top risks for 2021. And the competition rather than coordination uh, is going to be the order of business for climate mitigation uh, in the light of the Biden administration's climate push. Uh, I think it would be very, very unfortunate to see competition coming uh, in the battle to address uh, plastics pollution. Uh, I do think coordination and cooperation uh, will be absolutely crucial. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Justin. And excellent to uh, have to hear from all of your expertise on actually being engaged in the front line of this. Somewhat sobering to know that so few environmental organisations are involved um, in this area, and as you say, partly because it's so technical. And also really appreciated um, your emphasis on the need to engage developing countries um, in this process and to improve um, transparency and coordination among them. I also just wanted to note that you did make a link back to um, Karen's wider point is that we need a, a wider set of policy targets and a regulatory framework that is guiding this work around standards. Um, and that you also drew attention to some of the gaps around um, reducing plastics use in the first place, especially of single plastics use by looking for how we can promote um, use standards also to promote reuse and refill systems. And also I would add to that substitutes as well. So with that, I'm going to turn, I think it's a good segue into the presentation, uh, our next presentation by Feng Wang. And so I give you the floor to talk about UNEP's work in this area. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, yeah, so Thank I have you. a short slide to show. Uh, my name is Feng Wang. I work in UNEP uh, on consumption and production as well as circular economy. Um, actually, I have to admit that I'm an expert on the standardization process at all. I actually, um, my work focuses a lot on uh, developing circular economy solution for plastic in terms of policy support, business innovation, knowledge, and capacity. However, I would like to uh, take a, let's say, a long shot to see from the overall picture what kind of role standards can play. So this is the uh, the main intention of my uh, presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I said, UNEP's work on standards, eco-label, consumer information uh, comes from different teams, uh, work on different topics like policy, uh, science, uh, marine litter, and also uh, consumption production. So there are many different angles to looking to the topic. Uh, this is a summary of uh, different work stream within UNEP that where we uh, take a snapshot into the topic of policy and uh, standards. Uh, first of all, uh, as a usual practice, UNEP provide review of global, regional, and national policies related to different type of regulation and also standards of uh, plastic and plastic products, including single-use plastic and packaging and many other different type of um, policy. Uh, specifically related to standards, um, we also provide overview and also uh, analysis uh, of uh, standards labels and claim related to plastic in different uh, national contexts and also to see what are the commonality among different uh, system and also different standards. Uh, based on this kind of overview that uh, we also develop um, projects and activities to provide policy guidance and also technical support to either support government or business to develop their national policies in general on, on plastic uh, or different uh, uh, materials or products as well as specific standards so that we can bring in different type of experience to a specific context and help the stakeholders to um, develop standards and eco labels. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have a team dedicated to um, provide guidance and also support uh, how to develop better, more transparent and pertinent product sustainability information. This means that translating um, product uh, characteristic to the uh, consumer information that to consumer to support their decision uh, making. And that's a very um, unique work we are doing uh, within our team. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see Ecolabel is a very useful uh, tool to communicate different environmental impact of products uh, in terms of environmental footprint, chemicals, climate change, biodiversity, and many other features that we provide assessments on um, different eco labels and their um, effects and also influences on the um, on the market and also on environments. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, based on different national and uh, regional and global experience, we compile case studies and best practices on different topics and um, uh, to share knowledge uh, across the board 
to increase capacity. So that's a very quick way to, to introduce the work UNEP is doing in this field in general uh, related to standards, uh, labels, and consumer information. Next slide, please. So actually, um, my slides um, correspond to a lot of the analysis made in the previous um, uh, presenters, especially Reinhardt, I think he nicely show a life cycle diagram of the, um, um, of the plastic value chain. Um, when looking to uh, standards, I think there are many, many different standards uh, along the value chain or the life cycle of a product service system. So I, I made a small summary of a kind of uh, standards uh, where we see they are relevant for plastic and plastic pollution and where they can play a role. So the most obvious one we can think of standard from the very first impressions really at material level, as well as a product level that's related to packaging and also the plastic content itself. It tells us about the characteristic and also composition of certain quality, safety, um, let's say uh, features of the um, different materials and the different polymers within the product. Uh, such as the characteristic like a uh, resin addictive chemical concern in the products, it actually helps us to regulate and also define uh, the different level of um, material contained in, 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 in product or in materials. Uh, the second category we see that um, there are also standards that regulating on the, um, let's say, um, recyclability or reusability or compostability and different type of um, performance of the uh, materials related to the environmental performance. So this is where we see a lot of um, guidance and also standards coming from uh, different institute already um, introduced uh, by, by others. So this means that uh, from this category, um, by working on the standards, we can actually improve and also upgrade the quality of the materials and products uh, from the whole market point of view and in a certain market. Uh, this is more from product design production side. Uh, at the same time, um, we see a lot of work focusing on labeling and claims. Uh, strictly speaking, they are not part of the standard setting um, when we talk about material standards or product standards. Uh, however, they are very important uh, vehicle uh, or um, ways to communicate uh, the characteristic and also the features of different products. So they are equally um, important in terms of creating impact. This is where we also see a lot of um, labeling standards and also discussion there, how to transmit the proper information to the users, to the uh, procurers, and also to the consumers to make sure that they get the right and also get the proper information uh, for the right um, characteristic. Uh, another big area for standards we're talking about here is really focusing on the recycled uh, plastic or the recycled content uh, in plastic waste stream. Nowadays, we talk a lot about circular economy and recycling and recovery. Uh, we want to, or the government uh, want to create a market for secondary materials that back to the value chain, back to the product. This means that uh, the homogeneous property and the quality of recycled plastic is very crucial uh, to, um, to the production um, channel as a feedstock. This is where we have seen a lot of work trying to um, provide norms and standards and to improve the, um, uh, let's say, the quality of the recycled materials and plastic so that it can feed better back to the loop and to stu stimulate uh, circularity. And finally, there's also one very important element that apart from providing standards on the product or the, 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 the business itself, there is a whole uh, big process uh, within the value chain that's really the end of life or the recovery phase deal with sorting of plastic, um, cleaning the plastic, and also decontamination of the plastic in terms of virus and the uh, other uh, uncontaminated processes, and also process related to sorting, shredding, and also recycling of different facilities. Because we are living in the world, there are many, many different type of uh, technologies and uh, method to process plastic. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that uh, this process are detoxify the uh, plastic waste stream and sort them into more homogeneous stream and also recycle them in high quality. So this is where we think that um, having standard in place in the treatment process will help us to improve the efficiency and uh, reduce fragmentation of the recycling process. So this is where I see that um, it's already well spread across the whole life cycle of different topics to make sure that standard can play um, a role there. 
this is a kind of very quick overview of uh, standards where it can um, make a function. If we look into that, the general advantage of applying uh, standards is that we see it actually can influence the product design, selection material, the production phase, consumption and the market behavior, as well as consumer behavior to make the right choice. So it can make a lot of positive impacts uh, to divert the whole market into a more circular and sustainable direction. Well, at the same time, because we introduce a kind of norm here that we are able to introduce fair competition, reduce inconsistency or too many variation of different product uh, polymers or different interpretation of materials, so that actually we are getting to a more harmonized uh, uh, marketplace for materials and for also for performance. However, um, for all the benefits we see, there are still a lot of, um, uh, let's say, barriers and also gap to be closed uh, in the area of this topic. Uh, first of all, um, as Ren had and also other experts defined or showed already that uh, standards are usually made by different process, organization, territory. So we have observed, uh, let's say, a very complexity of unharmonized terminology, uh, let's say, definition, methodology, and uh, the process even are different. So with all this kind of different conditions in place, uh, even though standard is a world that we see that everything should be aligned, but actually in practice, we can end up many different types of standards different way of, um, you know, testing and different way of um, defining the, the quality of things. So this is where we have to align much better at uh, all levels. Um, the second thing is that uh, standards also sounds like a very professional uh, world, uh, either to the accreditation agency, to the government or to the experts. However, um, the variation and also the specific standards that may not be very visible to consumers, that which means that in the end, the way to create a pathway to impact may not be very powerful because at the end of the day, it's the individual consumers or the procurers who will decide the market and also make the choice. So how to make a connection from standards to uh, influence behaviors and also influence the market will be a very critical topic. And then uh, just an example that we also have seen that there's a lot of disconnection uh, between standard setting with the real life scenarios. So. Uh, the reason is that usually standards are defined in a very strict and also defined scope or methodology. However, in real life, there are many different, uh, you know, um, behaviors and activity happens. Just one simple example, just quoting one of our reports. Uh, in one of the standard setting for uh, plastic composting, uh, it defined the professional um, composting site usually for 12 weeks of composting to get the results of this kind of um, features. However, in real life, uh, in many cases, uh, we already know that either certain composting factory, they want to speed up the efficiency, the settings in there might be much uh, different or shorter time of composting, which in the end, the standard setting of the material might not match with the real life scenario. Another extreme case is, is that uh, if we design certain biodegradable plastic or composting plastic in certain facilities, but if they are shipped or smuggled into third world country for landfill for burning, then this does not match at all. And the original good intention of design standards uh, does not match with the end of life treatment. So there is a big uh, disconnection between what has been envisioned in the standard setting with what's happening in the real life uh, scenarios in the happening. So um, this is a kind of uh, different uh, barriers or gap to filling and uh, just want to already conclude my presentation so that we can have more discussion. Next slide, please. Yeah, just if I could intervene quickly, Feng, we, we need to wrap up quite quickly because we still have one more speaker to go. Thank yeah, you. Sure. So I think I mentioned all the points already and uh, the action to move forward is that we need to harmonize definition, terminology and criteria setting standards at the same time that we need to align standard at all levels, geographic levels. Uh, we also need to link better with the actual uh, real-time scenario setting. Uh, again, we should not forget that um, standard need to link better with the whole strategy of um, uh, reducing plastic pollution in terms of reduction of consumption, um, consumer buying, and also setting reuse standards and the state-of-the-art uh, treatment so that we do not uh, develop standard in isolation, but actually uh, working harmony with many other instruments together. So this is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for a very comprehensive um, presentation. I'm sorry that we end up having not enough time 
uh, one of the things that I think that um, we discussed actually as um, panelists in one of the pre briefings for this is the real need to have some more focused dialogues and discussions around standards and plastics. Um, so there will certainly be future opportunities, I think, with some of the speakers you have on this um, panel and others to engage in a, in a more in depth um, dialogue on some of these issues going forward. So I'd now like to turn to our final panelist, who is Anja von der Hopp who um, is from WIPO, and she's going to help us make the link between this standards discussion and the world of intellectual property standards and rules. Anya, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I also thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this event. I really enjoyed the preparation for that. Uh, from an IP perspective, um, um, there's not, not such a close link between patents and standards, so I'll generally in my presentation take a broader perspective on IP and plastics and then zoom in on certain aspects when it comes to the, the standard question. Um, so I think that uh, innovation has a, a great role to, to play and can help tackle uh, pollution. Uh, and in addition, there are also many um, solutions that already exist and that could, um, but we could do more to accelerate the transfer adoption and the deployment of these innovative solutions. So for those of you who don't know, intellectual property is, is part of the set of elements that, that are there to, to foster innovation, uh, enabling innovators to earn recognition and benefit uh, from what they invent, uh, invent or create. It refers to inventions, um, research articles, books, designs, symbols, names, images, and, and so on used in, in business. So with regards to plastics, um, and in, in the interest of time, I will not go into detail on, on um, those different types, but for two. So one um, IP right that I would like to mention is patents. Patents are granted um, by public authorities for technical inventions. In the fields of plastics, uh, they could relate to either the materials, for instance, uh, new chemical compounds that uh, are more easily biodegradable. Uh, they could uh, relate to packaging design, for instance, um, um, having uh, the same strength but less weight. And they could um, relate to recycling processes um, that, that are new and, and more uh, effective. In terms of the environmental labels, and, and we already heard that there's a wide range of uh, environmental labels available, uh, almost confusing from the consumer perspective. Uh, this mainly relates to, to the area of, of trademarks. And here we have um, the conventional trademarks that uh, are protected signs that help a company distinguish a product or a service from those uh, of their competitors. They are important means of communication um, and also we see that that uh, the trademarks that refer to certain um, environmental um, characteristics are, are um, increasing. Um, those could be problematic if they contain misleading uh, representations with regard to the environment. Uh, this is also um, referred to as, as greenwashing. And I'll come to, to that also in my concluding remarks. And then we have a specific uh, kind of, of uh, trademark, which are called certification marks. And these are the, the, um, the, the ones that we, we see as the echo labels. And there's really a, a wide range of, of uh, those labels, uh, for instance, EchoSense or Retray. Um, so the, the characteristic is that there's an independent organization that verifies that a certain product or service um, complies with a certain standard. And so the quality also depends. I think uh, um, we have referred to that earlier. Uh, it depends on the standard and on the process of verification and, and that independent um, organization uh, who's doing, who's carrying out that process. In terms of, um, of ISO standards and so on, um, we know from the telecommunication and consumer electronics industry that there are some cases where standards require certain um, patented technology in order to, to um, be implemented. 
Uh, I didn't find any of those uh, with relation to plastics, and and also I think that uh, this was confirmed uh, by by the mapping uh, that Richard has done. Um, no, Reinhard, sorry. So that's not not uh, such a an issue um, for uh, for our topic today. So in order uh, coming to the policy makers and the outlook, um, I think what policymakers can do or governments. Uh, I would say from the, the IP perspective, there's nothing specific with regard to, to plastics as such, but it's more uh, looking at the whole range of factors that have an influence or that foster uh, innovation and that make it more easily, um, that make it possible uh, for innovators to create something and to disseminate it or to flourish. So the, the first set of, of factors relate to the enabling environment, enabling innovation, that's the quality of institutions, the research infrastructure and market factors, as well as business sophistication. And I think I want to highlight two things here, uh, standards, but also standards that make it into, into regulation have obviously an important role to play uh, because they incentivize innovation as well, because we see that if regulation becomes uh, more um, becomes tightened up, that the, the patenting in an area um, designed to develop technology that makes it possible to to comply with a certain standard uh, is going up. So something that the the governments can certainly do. In terms of, I think that's also has been mentioned before. In terms of definition and terminology and standards. Those have also um, influence on the branding and the, the IP that is linked to the branding in terms of, for instance, making it easier for um, both the, the trademark offices, but also for competitors or consumers to identify pro proper, um, proper or uh, rely on, on uh, good um, standards, but also to identify uh, misleading claims in, in trademarks and refuse registration of such of such trademarks. Um, and apart from the in, in enabling environment, there's also the, the diffusion of, of uh, the knowledge that has been generated and the technology outputs where um, the governments can play a role in, in fostering that. From our side, I just want to quickly highlight um, an incentive that we started in, in 2013, which is called Wiper Green which is an online platform for technology exchange that contributes to the accelerated adaptation, adoption, and deployment of green technology solutions by connecting those who are looking for solutions and those who offer those solutions. And uh, in there, we find a wealth of um, products and technologies related to plastics, such as um, packaging materials, um, biodegradable products, bio-based products, and products made from recycled sources and recycling processes as well. So um, you see the, the link, I can also share it in the chat and I'm happy to, to answer additional questions. Thank you so much for, for your attention. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Anya. I was particularly, thank you for a great presentation, particularly interested in the WIPO Green platform. I think it would be really useful. I don't know if it's something that WIPO could do or others, but to really do a review of um, these kinds of um, plastic pollution uh, technologies and innovations that you have already in the WIPO Green database. Um, I know that for many developing countries, there is concern that as we raise standards for, um, for plastics and for single use plastics in light of pollution, that they want to be ensured that they have access um, to waste management technologies, that they're able to, to use in their own production, the latest or the best designed um, uh, the, the, the best technologies for um, improved plastic design and so on. So there is this sort of technology transfer element to this discussion to make sure that um, some countries are not disadvantaged um, in their effort to um, export products or to uh, export products that are packaged um, because they can't meet um, standards and technologies will have a role in that. Um, also really useful your, um, your point on the links between um, labeling and trademarks. And there might be a need for some further discussion around the kind of um, labeling of plastics that's used and this issue of misleading 
claims um, that you mentioned. So I think that will be two areas that will be worth um, further further discussion. So I'm going to open the door um, to the to some questions. The first one that came up, I'd like just to, to put to Karen. You received a question um, about whether um, the proposal that you developed is the proposal or whether there are other proposals for um, a global agreement um, on plastic pollution. Could you just respond to that for a bit to set the context? Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so there's no negotiations happening at this point at the international level. So everything that's been put forward at this point is a proposal. Um, so we've seen some from NGOs, etc. Um, and they look more at the elements of what an agreement should include. Um, but so I think what we've done in the Nordic report does take it a step further and uh, propose elements, but also the, the sort of mechanism of how to improve uh, waste management and design, etc. So um, I, I believe the, the Nordic report does take it a step further, but yes, these are all just proposals at the moment. Great. Okay. Now that that's very useful. I mean, I, I definitely agree. Yours is one of the most detailed and you really do place um, a, a strong emphasis on, on the role of standards in that as a, as a key area for international cooperation, which is really useful. Um, so we have another question. I'm going to run us about 5 or 6 minutes over the time because we um, have, I have not effectively moderated to keep everyone to their time. So we'll just take a few more minutes, but 1 was around this issue of enforcement of standards. And I'm wondering if either. Um, Austin or Reinhard um, could could speak to that. The, the point that the question made was that some manufacturers have deliberately sort of um, circumvented sort of standards or may not be able to meet them or misuse the standards or misclaim that they're meeting standards. So how do these get enforced? I turn to maybe to Justin first. That's a, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, there's, I think, a very interesting point circumvention. Uh, there is, uh, if you'd like, no necessarily agreed definition uh, of circumvention. Uh, when uh, we talk about circumvention, for example, it could mean uh, a rather large spectrum of activities, uh, all the way from uh, blatant cheating, uh, which perhaps was what we saw in the, the automotive industry with the CO2. Uh, standards uh, all the way through to if you much if you like much less subtle uh, approaches uh, a lack of consumer relevance for example in your test methods um, that can also be seen as as a circumvention as well uh, ecos did uh, try to define circumvention uh, in a report uh, that we published uh, i think 2 years ago uh, and there is also an interesting uh, and a, i think a very valuable uh, guide from the iec uh, on circumvention uh, so I think those are those, those are very interesting reference documents, and there is a Horizon 2020 project uh, called Antix uh, that is uh, looking at trying to take the issue of circumvention uh, a lot further. Uh, with regard to obviously standardisation, standards uh, are voluntary. Uh, they are voluntary instruments. Uh, essentially, they remain voluntary instruments uh, even when. Uh, markets such as the European Union uh, reference uh, specific standards uh, in the official journal. Uh, the standard technically, uh, if you like, remains voluntary, uh, even though the European Court of Justice uh, has said uh, that they do form part of EU law. Uh, so I think there's a, a very interesting development taking place there. There's currently a, a further court case in the ECJ that should hopefully clarify the situation uh, further. But I think in, in, in terms of circumvention, I think there is a lot of work to do to make sure that the standards are as robust uh, as possible uh, so that uh, you do uh, encourage uh, companies uh, to fully follow the standard uh, in a similar way, so that you essentially don't get a, you don't get a, a, a competitive advantage uh, by seeking to, uh, to 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 implement the standards uh, in a, a suboptimal way. Maybe just a, a short um, addition from my side. Uh, I mean, although the standards in, in Europe, although the standards remain uh, voluntary, uh, uh, the regulations on which uh, or the directives on which the standards are based or which they are intended to support, those requirements need to be uh, met. Uh, and uh, now you can use this or that standard uh, if it helps you to, to meet those requirements so that the legal uh, uh, obligation does not disappear. Now, uh, one of the main uh, 
uh, or one of the, the uh, let's say, uh, instruments uh, to uh, um, uh, enforce uh, use and uh, um, uh, of standards is also market surveillance. Yeah, in the European Union, you have various instruments for market surveillance where uh, products that are uh, 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 are re realized or uh, are identified as being on the market but not meeting certain standards with, with regard to, let's say, safety, that they are taken from the market, that there is an information system uh, within Europe. So there are instruments, but obviously this is a very complex and difficult issue. And if you want to cheat, uh, you may be successful in the beginning. Great, thank you very much, Reinhard. What I'd like to do is I'm going to turn um, to the, the speakers who haven't spoken at this point is um, Anya, Karen, and Feng, just to ask if you have any reactions to others, um, to to the comments of others on the panel. If there are any burning issues that you wanted to raise. No one not for me, thanks. No? Okay, great. Um, so I think that we should probably uh, wrap up now. I did just want to um, summarize by saying, I think that we have really co covered a broad terrain. Um, I think there's uh, one of the things that I'm aware of is that we do seem to use the language differently. I think if you're a standards person, you use standards in one way, very much referring to voluntary standards. But I was just this morning on a conversation with UK trade policymaking community and for them, they use the same language of standards to refer to what Reinhard and I think Justin would consider to be regulations. You know, so so we have this kind of when we're talking about this, I think it's 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 we we will need to be aware that there's um, a, a kind of different ways in which this terminology is used, and that there's lots of misunderstanding. I think about the degree, depending on what kinds of how you're um, understanding what a standard is, the degree to which they're compulsory, voluntary enforceable who set them you know are they set by governments or are they set by industry and others so that there's i think certainly a need just to be aware when we're speaking to the public or to policymakers about this that they may have different understandings of what the word standards mean um so i think we have covered the ground i believe we have achieved our goals of reviewing uh what the landscape is where some of the governance challenges lie We've looked at the um, at some of the different actors involved. We've examined some of the um, the limitations and also the opportunities. And we've also helped, especially through Karen's work, to put this in the in the context of current um, uh, proposals for international negotiations around um, plastic pollution. So, with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of our uh, speakers for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I do hope that we can look forward to further um, dialogue on this topic. Um, and I will just hand back to Diana to close. Yes, and thank you, Caroline, for having uh, moderating uh, this event very efficiently. I thought we went over time, but I think it was difficult to, to interrupt speakers that had uh, interesting things to say. Thank you also for who is still online with us and stayed uh, over time with us, and for who has been working behind the scenes to, to make this event happen.